You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. You do it this time. Welcome, everyone. Okay, I'll do it. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3. Page 4. Wait, what, what was page 1? Oh, it's like table of contents and crap. And three? Advertisements. Okay, that works. And this is one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And another host, Big Anklevich. Yep, and he's R-O-8-O-T. Right. Today's story is Creature of the Sea by Lisa Kusis. Lisa's work has appeared in numerous print and online venues, including the Poughkeepsie Journal, Not One of Us, Murky Depths, and Meadowhawk Press's Touched by Wonder anthology. She recently received an honorable mention in the 14th annual Chiaroscuro short story contest. When she isn't visiting the universe next door in search of story ideas, she resides in New York with her husband and several misbehaved cats. Creature of the Sea by Lisa A. Kusis. Do you hear them singing? Her words snapped Benjamin awake. The biography he'd been dozing over dropped onto the dining room table. Sitting beside the window, one hand on her stomach as if she was still pregnant, Melissa stared out at the sea. On the end table nearby sat a cup of tea, grown cold, and a dish of melted chocolate ice cream. Benjamin got up and approached her, moving slowly, breath held the way that one might approach a frightened parakeet, afraid that any quick motion might send it flying away. He listened. What, Mel? Whales? She tilted her head to look at him. Her eyes sparkled. No, something else. Something else? He prompted. She nodded. Don't you hear them? In the wind, sand scratched against the side of the house. And beyond that, he heard the constant white noise of waves, but nothing else. Melissa rose unsteady. Her sweater hung on her slim frame. The sleeves tugged down over her hands. She ran her sweater-covered fingers down his arm. Let's walk. Outside, the night smelled of salt and decay, erasing for a moment the memory of another smell. Antiseptic like stainless steel and rubber-soled shoes and sickness. Holding her hand, his thumb atop the throb of her pulse, he let her lead him across the stretch of beach, walking closer and closer to the water until stinging waves sloshed up against their ankles. She stared out at the ocean, one finger pressed against the skin below her left ear, and he knew she was listening. Later, in bed, he watched her sleep, her face blued by moonlight, a slight frown on her lips. She told him once that the ocean healed the wounded, that magic resided in the boundary where the land and the waves and the sky converged, because even in the darkest hours of night, it was never at rest. It never ceased changing. And come morning, Melissa always said, you never knew what might wash up on the shore. She'd grown up on the coast, come of age with sandy toes and wind-snarled hair, and though she'd married him and they'd moved far inland, sometimes when she walked by, Benjamin swore she smelled of sea salt and beech rose. He touched her hair, smoothing it back from her forehead, savoring the thereness of it. Only last week she'd still been in the hospital, and he'd been here, filling the house with the things she loved chocolate pudding and jasmine, iridescent clamshells and slim books of poetry. 
baskets of bright silk flowers and every album Jimmy Buffett ever made. He'd arranged for electricity to be turned on, but hadn't bothered with a phone. He had his cell. He remembered his madman's scavenger hunt that day when he removed scissors, knives, tweezers, and knitting needles, raiding medicine chests and cupboards, flushing handfuls of aspirin and sinus tablets down the toilet, and dumping gallons of cleaning fluids down the drain until the strongest liquid left in the house was red wine vinegar. He'd scrutinized every closet and crawl space until nothing remained that could cause Melissa harm, except perhaps the sea itself. And he knew the sea would never harm her. She was a creature of the sea. He had brought her home to heal. Benjamin slept, pressing his body against his wife. There had been too many failures. This was his reprieve, his last chance. He wouldn't fail her this time. In the morning, Benjamin opened his eyes to sunlight diffused by sheer curtains, crisp and white like the sheets of a hospital bed. He rolled toward Melissa, but the bed beside him was empty. He jerked up. Mel? She sat, slumped against the wall beneath the window, her head lolling to the side, a bottle of sleeping pills overturned beside her, silent and pale. Mel! Panic crashed against him and he dove for the bedside phone. Mel! He woke fully at the absence of the dial tone. He hadn't had them turned on. Where was the damn cell? Where was... Dreaming. Jesus. He rubbed his eyes. He looked again, his heartbeat slowing. Beneath the window sat only the rumpled comforter and an extra pillow. He blew out a breath and approached the window, peering out. In the distance, her auburn hair gleamed in the sun, and he squinted. It looked like she was kneeling next to something large. Maybe a beached whale? Throwing on jeans and a sweatshirt, he jogged down the stairs and out the door toward her. She knelt by the whale, dwarfed by the creature's bulk, her forehead pressed against its side. There, she sobbed, her hands hooked into claws that raked at its unmoving flesh. It must have beached itself overnight. It's dead, she said between sobs. Benjamin slid to the sand beside her and rubbed circles across her back. She had enough grief. They both had. Eventually, letting Melissa grieve for the creature, he rose and walked around it. Greenish gold and flecked with bits of orange, patterns and swirls reminiscent of a Van Gogh painting marked its flesh. It wasn't a whale. It wasn't even shaped like a whale, but more like a serpent. Thick in spots, thinner in others. Instead of smooth flesh, scales covered its length. By its neck, small, fan-like appendages drooped lifelessly. He examined its tail, its side, its face. Behind it, a large, winding track trailed up from the surf, as if a gigantic sidewinder had traversed the beach. It couldn't have been dead for long. No hint of decay's sweetness colored the air, and since it rested above high tide, he assumed it had slithered there on its own. Slithered. The creature's eyes were closed. Its mouth was huge. If it opened, Benjamin thought he could crawl right in. It was an impossible creature, an aberration, more myth than reality. He stared at it a long time, trying to reconcile its existence with what he knew of this world. Benjamin considered himself a creature of fractions and long division. What did he know of the sea and what lived there? We should call someone, he said. She stopped crying and looked up. No, she said. Please don't. They'll want to cut him up, and I couldn't bear that. After everything, I just couldn't. Benjamin bit his lip. In a day or two, it would start to smell. But how could he tell her no? Refusing to come inside, Melissa stayed with her head against the vile creature, her tears wetting its scales. Benjamin sat on the deck and watched her. In the afternoon, he brought her lunch. She took a few bites before setting the sandwich onto the sand. At dusk, she came in, her jeans sandy and wet, her hair tangled and smelling of salt, her ears windburned. She resumed her post by the window. It's not dead, she said. Perching on the side of the chair, Benjamin stroked her hair. 
separating tangles with his fingers. It's breathing, she said. It's not dead. In the morning, more creatures had slithered onto the beach to die. Benjamin counted seven and wondered if more might lie just out of sight. Melissa dashed out the door before he could stop her. She raced towards the creatures, bare feet kicking up geysers of sand. His heart chugged, and remembering how earnestly she said, It's not dead, he raced after her. She stumbled in the sand and then slid toward the nearest creature, putting her ear against what looked to be its chest. I hear its heartbeat, she said, smiling for the first time since the last miscarriage. Kneeling beside her, he put his own ear to the creature's side. Its skin, scales, were cold. It had to be dead. Then he heard the faint whomp whomp of a heartbeat. Benjamin yanked Melissa by her arm, and she fell back unceremoniously on her rear end. We'd better go get help, he said. No, she whispered. Sun glinted in her eyes. We have to help them. He shivered, suddenly cold. Benjamin stood, his hip angled against the kitchen cabinets as Melissa raided the refrigerator, piling fruits, vegetables, lunch meats, and cheeses onto the counter. When she'd emptied the refrigerator, she opened the freezer, emptying it of roasts and chops and ice cream. Afterward, she disappeared into the attached garage. After a few muttered curses and assorted clanking sounds, she returned, maneuvering a small wheelbarrow into the kitchen. She loaded it with the perishables, and then wheeled it out the side door. At the window, Benjamin watched as she launched her weight against the wheelbarrow, forcing it inch by inch through the deep sand. He let her be. If the creatures weren't dead, then they were at least dying. He'd brought Melissa there to heal, so if tending to dying creatures was what she needed, then so be it. Later, she handed him the car keys and a shopping list that included everything she felt belonged on a well-balanced diet for sea monsters. Fish, leafy green vegetables, and dairy products topped the list, followed by grains and even a few sweets. Her reborn sense of wonder pleased him, and despite the absurdity of her request, Benjamin knew he'd empty their savings of every last penny to indulge her. Practically bursting, she greeted him when he returned laden with groceries. Come quick! Snatching his hand, she led him across the beach. Only a few torn pieces of cardboard from a half gallon of fudge ripple ice cream remained from the earlier food offerings. Even from a distance, he saw movement. Halting, he dug his heels into the sand, but her momentum carried them both forward. The chest of the creature swelled with breath, puffs of condensed air rising from its nostrils. The skin on its belly rippled as if dozens of hermit crabs bustled below the surface. Despite his better judgment, Benjamin approached and touched its rippling skin. Its flesh undulated, reminding him of a wave machine that sends colored liquids sloshing first one way and then back. Its scales felt warmer and as soft as snakeskin. He circled the creature, studying its features and listening to its strengthening heartbeat. At its head, wanting to feel its breath, he reached toward its nostrils. One eye blinked open. Ben saw his own reflection visible in a golden iris as big as a frisbee. He jumped back, jerking his hand away. Unfazed, Melissa leaned in and pressed her face against the creature's neck. See, she said, they're going to be okay. Benjamin locked the door that night, as if a sea monster could turn a door handle. When Melissa fell asleep, he carried her upstairs and away from the window amazed at how light she'd become. Her arms flopped backward. The scars on her wrist were healing. Setting her onto the bed, he tucked the sheets around her, then closed and locked the bedroom door. For good measure, he pushed the dresser in front of it, slowly and quietly, so as not to wake her. After a while, unable to sleep, he cracked open the bedroom window and breathed in the sea air. Watching the white caps break against the jetty, A distant bonfire glowed like a red aura. No voices reached him, but every now and again, 
Silhouettes moved near the fire. Eventually, he closed his eyes and listened. This time, he heard unseen creatures singing, their melodies rising and falling in rhythm with the waves. In the morning, the creatures were gone. Only pale stretches of discarded skin marked their passing. In the mist, Benjamin could almost believe they'd just evaporated, leaving behind only this trace. The newest supply of monster food was gone, too. He hugged Melissa closer and inched back toward the house, scanning the beach. It stretched, unbroken, for miles. We'd better call someone, he said. Someone who knows about these animals. No! She pulled away, her eyes blazing. Nobody knows about them. There's something new. Catching her by the arm again, he moved towards the safety of the house. Something magical, she said. For the rest of the day, he saw no sign of the beasts. Maybe they'd gone back out to sea, he hoped. Maybe they'd come ashore to molt and then left. Melissa set out more food, and he watched her all the while, his muscles tensed, ready to grab her and run. Amazingly enough, Benjamin thought, with a wry sort of humor, that in the course of a few days, the worry over suicide attempts had been replaced by worry over the potential of her becoming monster chow. That night, she moved from the window only long enough to shower. Then, hair dripping, she returned to her post. I see them, she said finally. Benjamin came to the window and pressed his face to the glass. I don't see anything. Just those kids having a bonfire. She put her hand on his cheek and gently angled his head the other way, tisk-tisking as if to say how very silly he was. Then he saw them in the shallows, golden eyes reflecting the moonlight. White caps, luminous against their dark scales. I should warn those kids. His throat felt dry, and he desperately needed a drink. Something stronger than lemonade or cocoa. Melissa smiled. I wouldn't worry about it. When Benjamin slept that night, he dreamed of people screaming. In the morning, he looked out of each window in the house. Upon seeing none of the creatures, he stepped outside, an eager Melissa at his side. Over the sound of the waves and the wind came the sound of music, full of static and almost unrecognizable. Benjamin's stomach dropped. Tugging Melissa's hand, he headed toward the noise. Half buried in the sand, the radio still blared beside the dead bonfire. The station dial twisted all the way to the end. An array of used condoms and broken beer bottles, duffel bags, and jackets decorated the sand. All around, chaotic footprints gave the beach the look of the sight of a primitive dance. Enormous webbed prints mixed with smaller human markings. Halfway between the spent bonfire and the ocean, the sand darkened to brown. Blood. Melissa shrugged, her eyes fixed on a point beyond Benjamin. His stomach dropping, he turned. The creatures approached slowly. Graceful, they seemed to glide over the sand, though they weren't slithering. Mesmerized, Benjamin marveled at their size and at their strangeness. Then Melissa was running toward them, rooster tails of sand spraying up in her wake. Melissa! God damn it, Mel! He called after her. Despite his shouts, she kept going, not once looking back. Damn it! He took off after her. Lighter on her feet and more accustomed to moving on the beach, she outdistanced him as he stumbled on the hills and valleys of sand. She closed the distance between her and the animals, even as he stumbled again and again to his knees. The creature stopped moving and stood, seeming to watch as Melissa plunged toward them, their heads weaving on their long necks. Trailing behind, Benjamin called her name over and over. Melissa. When Melissa stopped running, the nearest creature eased toward her. Benjamin froze afraid any movement might provoke an attack. Holding his breath, he sent out a prayer for his wife to do the same, prayed that the creatures would walk right by her, that they wouldn't suddenly charge. Melissa took tiny steps forward, stretching her hands out, palms up, as if approaching nothing more than an unfamiliar dog. Step by step, she erased the space between her and the creature, arms open wide. Benjamin crept forward again slowly and as silently as he could, planting one foot into the sand before moving the other one. 
the nearest creature stiffened, its legs locking, its scaly ruff opening in an orange and gold fan. The day is holding its breath, he thought. Even the waves seemed to stop. Only Melissa continued forward, in slow motion and yet, somehow, too fast for him to stop her. He took a step, slowly, slowly, but the creature jerked its head to face him. It rose to its full height, its scales lifting slightly, so that it looked like a cat with its fur standing on end. In the sunlight, the scales shone like mirrors, reflecting the sunlight, blinding him. Small protrusions textured its broad, seahorse-shaped face. Ignoring Melissa for the moment, it contemplated Benjamin, with eyes like liquid gold. I'm seeing a dragon, he thought. A dragon from the sea? Benjamin stood motionless, barely daring to breathe. Something seemed different about it. He thought back to the rise and fall of its chest as it had lain in the sand, the ripple of its flesh, the sidewinder tracks that marked its passage up the beach. It had feet now. He stared at its webbed feet. Sharp claws protruded from each toe, each claw like a pirate's hook. It returned its attention to Melissa and he dared another step forward. As soon as he did, it whirled back toward him, condensed air steaming from its nostrils. It snarled and bared its teeth, which looked like they could bite through iron. At the creature's snarl, Melissa swiveled to look at him, gaping as if surprised to see him standing there, immobile in the sand. Behind her, the rest of the creatures moved closer. Ben, she said, her voice stern. Don't move. Despite the situation, he snorted back laughter at the irony of her device. She turned her back on him and faced the dragon. Hello, she said to it. Wild laughter bubbled in his throat. His wife was speaking to some kind of mythological creature that had transformed from sea creature to land creature as easily as a caterpillar metamorphosed into a butterfly. It swung around to look at her. Though its posture hadn't softened, it didn't snarl. Instead, it dipped its head to examine her, and then sniffed her, its face so close to hers that its breath stirred hairs on the top of her head. Benjamin held his breath as Melissa lifted one hand and touched the scales under its eye. The creature startled, jerking back. It opened its mouth, a long, forked tongue unfurling toward Mel. He dared a few steps forward. All the creatures were intent on Melissa then. They ignored his approach. The tongue flicked towards Melissa. He envisioned a cobra poised to strike, its fangs filled with deadly venom. Melissa stood, unmoving. No fear in her eyes, just fascination and something else, something soft and maternal. Benjamin wanted to reach for her. He thought he was close enough, but he couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't think. He could only watch in horrified awe as the forked tongue touched Melissa's face, her arms, her neck. He wanted to scream. She closed her eyes, letting the creature examine her, and still Benjamin waited for the strike, for her scream of agony. The creature withdrew its tongue. Melissa opened her eyes, and they stared at each other. Melissa, he whispered. Then all pairs of golden eyes swiveled toward him, focusing. Two of the creatures closed in. He backed up, stumbled. Don't move, Melissa said. He backed up again, one step, two. One of the creatures crouched, poised to spring. Ben? Melissa said. A second creature crouched and he closed his eyes, waiting for it to be over. Then Mel did something he would remember for the rest of his life. She sang the first notes of a lullaby her voice halting at first, then stronger, the music rising over the waves. He knew the song. She'd sung it every night since she first found out she was pregnant. She'd sung it unfailingly until the night she'd woken him, crying and doubled over, clutching her abdomen. Mel sang it now. Benjamin opened his eyes to see a dozen golden eyes fastened on her, heads swaying like snakes before a snake charmer. Singing verse after verse, she began to walk down the beach, away from him. Seven impossible creatures followed her, walking with impossible grace across the sand. Sinking onto the sand, Benjamin could have cried. Eventually, 
eventually, he found the courage to stand and walk back to the house. Benjamin scanned the beach, but both Melissa and the dragons had vanished. He shouted for Melissa until his throat ached, but she didn't reply. Remembering his cell phone on the counter, he stumbled inside. He'd call the police, he thought, or maybe a marine biologist at the local college. Hell, he'd call the damn ASPCA if he thought it would help. The cell phone was gone. Closing his eyes, he visualized himself holding it. Benjamin shook his head. He knew where he'd left it, and it wasn't there. He opened kitchen drawers, sifting through the blunt utensils that remained after his initial raid. No phone. He opened the cabinets, pushed aside canned goods. He opened the refrigerator, but a glance told him it was empty. Melissa had cleaned it out once again to feed her minions. Downstairs, he tore apart everything and then, breathing heavy, looked at the mess. Lampshades askew, the sofa halfway across the room, and the contents of Melissa's pocketbook lay strewn on the floor, but no phone. On his way to trash the upstairs, Benjamin heard the door open. His heart pounding, he turned. Melissa stood in the open doorway, just a silhouette with the sun behind her. Still, he knew it was the phone she held in her hand. She wiggled it. Is this what you're looking for? Her voice mocked. He flashed back to all the time spent preparing the house for her, making it safe, and her tone hurt. Mel. He took a step toward her, and she retreated back outside. Thank God. They won't hurt me, she said. He nodded. I can't give you the phone, she said. Why not? I'm just going to call for help. No. She shook her head. You can't. They'll hurt Sigmund. Sigmund? I named him. Melissa, please give me the phone. She turned and bolted, running full throttle towards the waves. He raced after her, feeling deja vu. How many times had he chased after her in the last few days? Twice? Three times? She reached the ocean and kept going until she stood knee-deep in the surf. She held the phone high over her head. Mel! Benjamin splashed in after her. She heaved the phone. It carried far and then dropped with a small splash way past the breakers. Shit, Mel. Dripping and shaking, he stormed inside and grabbed his car keys. If it meant tossing her kicking and screaming over his shoulder, he planned on taking her away from here. She surprised him by coming quietly. He didn't bother packing. Grabbing her hand, Benjamin led her to the car. She slid into the passenger side and sat with her hands folded in her lap. Fumbling the key into the ignition, he twisted. The engine rolled and grumbled, but didn't catch. He tried a second time. A third. Finally, Benjamin yanked the hood release and got out, ready to rebuild the whole damn engine to get them out of here. Beneath the hood, the engine stood in disarray, wires pulled, parts missing. Melissa said nothing. With a small smile on her face, she pointed to the ocean. He pictured spark plugs and wires lying on the seabed beside his cell phone. He considered walking for help, but it was off-season, and he certainly couldn't drag his unwilling wife miles to the nearest occupied home. I could go by myself, he thought. But how could he go and leave her alone with the creatures? At night, she stopped sleeping. Instead, she sat by the window upstairs at his insistence and sang lullabies often repeating the same one over and over again, sometimes singing and sometimes humming. She sang until he heard the melody even when she wasn't singing, until everything, even the crash of the waves, sounded like the lullaby. During the daytime, she roamed the beach, the creatures following her whenever they weren't fishing or feeding. If he approached, the entire drove would turn on him, hackles raised, teeth bared, He wasn't allowed near his wife, and Mel just smiled and waved, admonishing him always to be still and go inside. Often, she perched on the rock, staring across the waves, her smile far away and happy while the creatures played in the shallows. With a chill, he understood. Her smile was that of a first-time mother, watching her newborn sleeping, admiring each rise and fall of the baby's chest in awe at its very existence. Only Mel's surrogate babies were massive and murderous.
Just before midnight, Melissa slept, her sleep-deprived body taking over. She slumped against the bedroom window, her head on the glass. Even in sleep, her lips moved to the words of a silent lullaby. Satisfied that she was sound asleep, Benjamin closed the bedroom door and secured it with a coil of hose he'd found in the garage. It wasn't pretty, he thought, but it effectively trapped her in the room. If he walked quickly, or maybe even ran, he figured he could probably find help by morning. He filled a bottle with water and then slipped into his jacket. Outside, the air held promise of an early winter. He made it as far as the mailbox when a dozen eyes blinked open all around him, reflecting like polished metal in the moonlight. A snarl arose from his left, low and throaty, and close. He froze, forcing himself to breathe in measured, even breaths. He counted to ten, counted to ten a second time, and then turned and bolted for the front door. Inside, he slammed the door and locked it. Panting, he pushed the love seat in front of the door and then collapsed into it, listening to the monsters sing their own lullaby from the other side of the wall. In the morning, Benjamin mixed up blueberry pancakes, Melissa's favorite, from what groceries remained. Leaving them on a plate in the oven to keep them warm, he climbed the stairs to free Melissa. He'd listened for her all morning, waiting to hear her protests at being confined, but apparently her body had needed sleep more than her heart had needed freedom. He tore his fingernails trying to undo his handiwork. Pancakes, he said in his best cheerful voice. The door opened on an open window in an empty room. Damn it! He took the stairs two at a time. Downstairs, he shoved the love seat away from the door and flung it open. Melissa! God damn it, where are you? Down the shore, at least another six creatures had washed up in their dormant phase. More lay in the other direction. God damn it! From the bedroom window, white bed sheets twisted in the breeze. Below the window, footprints led toward the water. He ran toward the ocean. The creatures frolicked in the surf. Among them, her arms hooked around one's enormous neck was his wife. Melissa! But she ignored him. His heart pulsed in his wrists, and his breath raged like a gale in his ears. He tore back into the house, looking for a weapon, any weapon. This was going to end. He would kill them before he would let them take his wife. No matter how much she loved them, they were monsters, abominations. He yanked the kitchen drawers open so hard they crashed onto the floor. He emptied the pantry of every last item. Dented jars rolled across the floor in haphazard arcs. Nothing. He opened the downstairs closet and tossed coats and boots across the couch. Nothing. Benjamin felt a stab of deja vu. Hadn't he just done this looking for his cell phone? He went upstairs. Nothing in the bedroom. Nothing in the bathroom. Nothing. He raced downstairs, stumbling over boots. He tripped and fell. Benjamin cursed, but it came out silently because he had no breath left. Leaning against the wall and gulping air, he watched out the window as Melissa allowed the creatures to tow her farther out to sea. They were past the breakers now and still moving. Melissa! He yelled when he could. Melissa! He smashed the window with his fist. Shards of glass rained on the floor, shattering. Bits of glass landed in his hair, caught in his skin. He shook his hand. It bled freely. Benjamin stared at the blood, then at the bloody fragment of glass that had done the damage. It would do. He wiggled the largest shards free from the window frame. The glass was thick, created to withstand the elements of the shore. It needed something to serve as a handle. Benjamin looked at the banister. Natural oak. It would be perfect. He kicked at the supports, rocked his weight against the rail until it gave. Once the railing was off, the vertical slats came off easily, about two feet high. They were just right. Using a piece of the glass, he sawed through a length of hose and then used it to fasten the larger shards to the pole. When he'd finished, he admired his weapons, smiling at his resourcefulness. Not bad for a creature of long division. He felt somehow primal. Armed, he headed outside, glancing at the dormant creatures lying across the shore. The urge to gut them swept over him. But looking out at Melissa, he knew that they could wait. 
Oblivious to his murderous intent, Melissa waved to him with her free arm. Just a, hey honey, how you doing, kind of wave. He gritted his teeth, feeling rage sweep over him. Plunging toward the ocean, he launched himself in, weapons ready. Waves broke across his knees and the current, strong, pulled at his feet. One shoe came off, then the other. He let them go like vestiges of his normal, once upon a time life, struggling to keep his footing. Freaks of nature! He yelled at the creatures. He yelled something else that the wind carried away, and then he just yelled wordlessly a battle cry of a desperate husband. The creatures seemed perplexed. At first they just stared, an expression that seemed somehow human and almost amused on their faces. It gave him time to close the distance between himself and the closest beast. Holding out his makeshift spear, he dove for it, praying to Neptune that his aim was true. Melissa shrieked, shock and confusion in her tone. The spear struck home a split second before the water closed over him. Seawater filled his mouth and his nose stung his eyes. He struggled to get his footing. Choking and gagging, he realized he'd somehow managed to hold on to one spear. The other spear protruded from the flesh of the nearest creature. The creature seemed stunned for a moment, and then it shrieked. The sound at the outer range of his hearing. He heard glass shattering up and down the shore. Thankfully, the glass on his spear remained intact. He readied the weapon, holding it high, trying to keep his footing as waves broke around his knees. The creature shrieked again, and then half a dozen monstrous bodies closed in. Eyes opened wide, ruffs glowing orange against the sky. Benjamin held his spear out, fainted with it, and then they were upon him. He felt the jab of ice picks on flesh as forked tongues struck at his face. Claws ripped his legs. His only remaining weapon fell into the ocean. The first creature shook the spear from its side and tossed it into the air. Benjamin closed his eyes, waiting to die. But they were playing with him, he realized. Playful cats with a hapless mouse. Blood ran into his eyes. A bone in his arm snapped. It sounded the same as the banister had when he'd broken it. Then he was completely underwater, looking at everything through a veneer of moving liquid. He heard the muffled sound of monsters singing to each other as they played. Hollowed by the water, their song echoed in his ears. He prayed that this wouldn't be the last sound he would ever hear. Then, as sound and light began to fade, another sound came. Melissa! Benjamin tried to smile, tried to tell Melissa that he understood now. She was a creature of the sea, and she was only tending to her own. Through the veil of seawater that stood between him and the world, he saw the creature lean in from behind Melissa. Then she was shrieking over and over again. No! Then everything, mercifully, faded to black. No! Waking felt like swimming up through layers of seawater toward the sun. His limbs had the weight of boulders and his lungs ached from holding his breath. He opened his eyes. There was no seawater, no creatures. He was in the bed in the A-frame. Melissa perched beside him. She sponged his face with a damp washcloth. She smiled. It was a familiar smile, a smile he remembered from their wedding. All happiness and peace. How long had it been since he'd seen that smile? He breathed and it hurt. She set the washcloth onto the nightstand and leaned in to touch his cheek. Benjamin reached for her hand, held it against his cheek for a long time. It's okay, she said. It's going to be okay now. He smiled up at her and then swung his legs over the side of the bed and sat up. His head pulsed, blackness welling up inside, his gorge rising. He pushed it back and then rose to his feet. Melissa grabbed his good arm. Sit back, she said. It's okay. We can go home now. She knelt down beside the bed and rummaged around beneath it. When she rose, she held something out to him like a gift. Blinking to clear his vision, he saw spark plugs, wires, and a few other miscellaneous pieces of his car. Relief washed over him. He tottered to the window, wanting to taste daylight not seen through a layer of ocean. Melissa stood behind him. Her breath warmed his bare neck. You've been unconscious for a long time, 
she said. He leaned out the window. Outside, the creatures were everywhere. Some played in the water, others fought mock fights, rolling and fainting in the sand. Many more lay dormant along the waterfront. Right underneath the window, its golden eyes blinking up at him, one of the creatures stood guard. Melissa moved so that she stood beside him and they looked out of the window arm in arm. Below, the single creature rose to its full height. Sigmund, he imagined. It stretched, yawned, and then spread out a brand new set of wings. The wings were the color of flames and spanned at least three times the creature's width. He turned to look at Melissa. She smiled that motherly smile. As if in response, Sigmund flapped his wings gracefully. Maybe in greeting, or maybe to reassure Melissa that he would follow her anywhere. Author's Note Like Melissa in Creature of the Sea, I grew up near the ocean. Though I live further inland now, it's still it's a part of me, and I find the influence of the sea and the coastal landscape creeping again and again into my fiction. In the story, Ben recalls Melissa telling him that magic resides in the boundary where land and waves and sky converge, and I believe that it does. Something I always hope to convey in my stories is a sense of wonder in the world around us. That you might turn a corner on any given day and find something magical, something impossible, something that might be both horrible and wonderful all at once. Although Ben is the point of view character in this story, Melissa's plight is what initially inspired this piece. Like most writers, I tend to be a hopeless people watcher, and one of the things I've always marveled at is the human ability to cope with tragedy and grief. Many years ago, I was there when a friend struggled with the loss of a baby. As Melissa does in her own way in this story, my young friend coped by turning so much of her love and affection to a tiny kitten that she'd adopted. As heartbreaking as it was to see, still, that kitten helped her to heal. Years later, when writing Creature of the Sea, I understood Melissa. I understood her thought process, why she did the things she did. In much the same way, I understood Ben, too. We do what we have to do in order to cope. Even if that means that sometimes dragons from the sea become surrogate children. Okay, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. Yes, thank you for listening. Good night. No, 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 not good night. Uh, we'll do that over. Thank you for listening. Good night. Now, see, now you did it. No, the oh. problem is we're not supposed to say goodnight after that. Oh, jeez. All right, OT. All right, OT. Can you ask the robot, please, to edit out all the mistakes we've made? Um, are you edit those out for us? Was that a yes? Uh, something like that. Do I want to know what it was, or should we just go on? Just go on. Okay. I'm just trying to think if, if now would be a time to talk about the story briefly. Sure. Or if, if we're going to uh, talk just about going. it, now would be the time. I really liked this story. We don't usually talk about the stories themselves because we tend to record these things on different days. Right. But uh, I don't know. There was something sad and kind of beautiful about this story, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I was really impressed by the writing of this story. Uh, you know, lots of times I find being a male writer, more or less, that it's it's very easy for me to understand the mindset and the motivations of a male character. And it's kind of mysterious or confounding to get into the head of a female character, especially if it's a you know, man, woman, husband, wife kind of thing. Many times I'll just go first person so that I don't even have to get into the wife's head. Uh, and in this case, where... The wife was acting in an irrational, illogical way. You know, that should have been alienating for me, but it, I, I don't think that it was. And it's a female writer of the story, but it's the story is told through the husband's point of view. And that impresses me. Yeah. And it was very believable. There was never once that I thought that oh, a man wouldn't do that. Yeah, I, I could 
very definitely empathize with the the husband and you know how how difficult it is sometimes you have those feelings of the need to protect your family and this woman you know would not allow herself to be protected by him maybe there are certain things that i you know i'm never going to get past maybe there are certain biases from just growing up a certain gender that you can't ever outgrow or, or step beyond and you just have to try to be understanding and try and open your mind to other points of view. Then again, maybe not. Maybe men are just better. Yeah, I've heard you thought that way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that ain't funny, man. You know what part I really dug is the sound effects for the, the creatures. <laughs> I liked it when the creatures went... <laughs> That's not bad. Uh, because the two of us are both male, a lot of times it's. Can I be, I be honest here and just say, it's 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 a pain, if we've got a story with a female narrator or female main character because sometimes it doesn't doesn't sound right when a man reads a first person story or a, a female centric story, uh, and I've heard it on other podcasts or I've heard audio books where you know it's a it's a woman story and a man is reading it or, or vice versa and. Anyway, it's just the two of us most of the time reading. So this was really cool that a, a woman had written a story, and yet it's totally fine for the narrator to be male. Anyhow, I guess I, what I was trying to say is, Lisa, send us more stories if you'd like. Of course, if you were offended by what I just said, send us hate mail. You'll yeah. still get on the podcast with a hate mail. Yes, you can just send it on down to editor at doomsteep.com. If you have more stories to send us, instead of hate mail, you can send them to submissions at doonsteve.com, and uh, we'll take a look at them. Make sure you read the uh, the submission guidelines before you submit a story. I mean, I'm sure people usually do, but they're there to help let you know what we're looking for. Anyhow, uh, the website? doonsteve.com, D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F. One other thing that you could do that would be nice, I was just looking at our uh, listing on iTunes. Oh, we're out there. Yes, we are. And uh, so far, no one's given us a review yet. So if you really think that we're great, then head on over there and give us a review and tell everybody how great we are. Yeah, that works. And you know what? If you don't think that we're great, w what are you doing listening? Turn it off right now. Don't ever go to iTunes. Never! There is one other thing you guys can do uh, to help us out, and that would be to press the button. I press the button. Can I segue for a little, for just a second here? Sure. Okay. Um, you're married, mm -hmm. right? And I, I myself don't have a wife. Because you're gay. Well, no, just I, I don't have a wife. Because you're gay. Just because a person is is unmarried and has a great affection for Judy Garland and Liza Minnelli, for for the entire Vincent Minnelli family. Doesn't mean... It, I mean, that's perfectly acceptable, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. I mean, it's fine if that's who you are. Absolutely. I mean, I have many gay friends. My father's gay. Okay, let, let's let move on, all right? <laughs> sure. You are married. Uh-huh. And the other week, there was going to be a really terrible snowstorm. Oh, like. Right. Uh -huh. Storm of the century. No, yeah. The storm was going to be coming down. It was a nor'easter. Eh? <laughs> and your good wife told me not to come over to your house to do the podcast because of the snowstorm. And uh, what did I do? You came anyway. I came anyway. Thank you. Sorry, I had to hold up the little sign that said you came. Keep card. Yes, I came anyway. And we did our podcast and then when it was time for me to leave, at the end of the night, what had happened? <laughs> you were completely snowed in. Yes. And so we got a shovel and we tried to dig my car out and it didn't work. And ultimately tell the folks what uh, we had to do. In the end, I had to pull my car over and actually physically push your car with my car. And that was very difficult because you were well into the ice. So I had to nudge you just with the left corner because bumper. Because if you came directly behind me, your car got yeah, stuck Yeah, I would too. have been stuck completely. And I did get stuck a tiny bit. We actually had to get out once and push my car back out so that I could then 
push your car out. Good times. Yes, and then I went home. I did about 20 miles per hour on the freeway. And uh, do you know what point I'm trying to make here? No. You have no idea. I don't. The point I'm trying to make is this is the sacrifice that we have been trying to do to do this podcast. Oh. And it would be very nice if someone rewarded us with a donation. It doesn't have to be a large donation, but it has to exist. So <laughs> you're you... trying to get a donation because you were stupid enough to get stuck in the snow. I was stupid enough to think the podcast was important and oh, say, you know what, very stupid. to heck with the snowstorm. We're going to do this podcast. Plus, you know, it was the end of the year. We tried to get it in, in oh, time right, for right, the New Year's true. and all that stuff. And if we put it off another day or two, then, you know, would, we would have missed that deadline. Anyway, folks, don't let my death be in vain. <laughs> Please donate. Just, just, just donate a little bit. I'm sure there's some rich spinster cat lady out there right now. And if we could only get her to listen to the podcast, <laughs> yeah. things would be great. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, ma'am, when you donate, I promise we'll put that cats versus dogs episode in. <laughs> and but you're I in will favor say of nice dogs. things about cats. I will lie <laughs> and talk about how cuddly they are. And I love that they show no affection to human beings. <laughs> okay, moving on. Last time on our last show, we uh, made a little call out for some volunteers to help us out with various things. And amazingly enough, we got some volunteers. Um, so we'd like to thank John Smith of 223 Crescent Circle for volunteering. Hey, you're the man and woman. Thanks a lot. But yeah, we, we got somebody that said they would help us read submissions. So hopefully the turnaround time will go down from forever to maybe, you know, a few weeks. <clears throat> so we got that. Uh, there was somebody who said that they would help us uh, with voices. Yeah. Which is really cool. We got actually two people to volunteer to do uh, the reading of the story. So I think we really uh, may get an uptick in the speed of the returns for the folks who submit stories. That'll be cool. So are we full up? Can we finally replace R080T? Oh, of course we... not. Oh. We're not even close. I think we have uh, plenty of opportunities still available. And um, there's one that we didn't even mention last time. We completely spaced on it. was that if you are a musician or a part of a band or, or whatever, you know, we could seriously use some music on this place. I mean, right now all I do is throw everything together with Mac's uh, garage band program and you know, see how, well, it's adequate. If but, you have Down syndrome. But it would be nice to have some, some, some actual music to go along. And even a, a theme song. What, weren't you saying that you wanted a special theme song too? <laughs> That's right. For the October Scary Story winners, you know, the, the stories that people submitted for us, I thought it would be cool if we had maybe a scary theme song for those particular episodes. And yeah, we're just about to start on our very first one of those. And so if somebody, you know, drummed something up on a zither and sent it our way, you know, it would be really cool. But you guys don't have to be professional composers to create some kind of music and all that. Just be kind of nice to have something for our introduction to the stories and uh, but yeah, for and our it, all musical episode. <laughs> and if you have a band, if you have a, if a website where you uh, put out your music or whatever, let us know. We'd love to promote you as well as, you know, use your music on our show. That would be a cool way for both of us to get a little... It would be like a synergy. Isn't that a word? Now, that was the computer from Jam, yes? Oh, that's right. Wow, dude, the fact that you know that. That's not all. <laughs> but we'll deal with the Jam issue in a future podcast. I'm not sure that our listeners are ready to hear this confession about Jam. <laughs> Okay, so we still need volunteers. If you'd like to be a reader, if you've got artistic talent and you'd like to send us some illustrations, we had someone volunteer to help us out on the web. Yeah, a really cool thing. Now, thanks to Nicole, we have a Facebook page that you can check out. You can search up Dune Steve on 
Facebook, and you can become our friend. Seriously? Yes, you can be our friend. But and does that commit them to actually be our friend in real life? I think so. I think. Oh, that's so great. I, we can like drop by their house and like crash there for a week if we have to. Once they become our friends, that that works for me. Thank you, Facebook people, and thank you, sudden death Nicole, for that. Also, uh, we still need people to do voices. Somebody volunteered to do a voice, uh, but but sadly, it was not female. Again, I I, I would like. There to be female voices so that I don't have to do the voice. You don't have to do the voice. How, how did we do that girl voice the last time? Well, I, that was when I just kicked you really hard in the nuts. And, and then after that, you sounded like Rashina Outfield. I, I have no memory of any of that. When you played it back, I honestly didn't know that was me. And I wondered where the blood in my underwear came from. <laughs> you people are pigs! Sorry, folks. We'll edit all of this out. But if you are a female and you can do an English accent or an Aussie accent or a Scottish accent or if you Irish can speak or oh, can you imagine a girl with an Irish accent? Canadian accent. No, we will have no Canadians on this part. In fact, if you are Canadian, please turn it off. No, uh, if you are of the feminine persuasion and you would like to do voices, it would be really, really cool. <laughs> Uh, you know, at OT, I sit next to Rich like on a daily basis, and I don't, I don't think we're going to find a single woman who's willing to volunteer for that. Do I want to know what he just... No. No, I... Right back at you, at OT. I hope you get robot syphilis. <laughs> Is that a computer virus? Oh. Go, go, go. So if you'd like to help us out, how do they let us know? They can just drop us an email to editor at doonsteef.com and we'll get right back to them and work it out. Drop us a line. We'll be anxiously waiting. I mean, seriously, please. Drop us a line. 080T, can you play the sad music, please? Uh, please? <laughs> wow. That I'm was sorry, quite man. a voyage for such a short trip. But anyhow, there was one other thing that you were going to tell me that somebody contacted you with a promo. Yeah, somebody uh, mentioned to me a podcast that they listened to. They said it was really great and that I ought to check it out. So I checked it out, and they said that uh, if we played their promo on our show, that they would play our promo on their show. And so I thought, well, we can't turn down that. So I went, and I checked it out, and I listened to the promo. You liked it? I listened to it, and I thought, Psh, I'd play this even if the guy wouldn't play ours. I'd play it if he told us to go f*** ourselves. I'd tell us to go f*** ourselves, and I'm part of the Dune Steve. Audio yeah, fiction magazine. You say that a lot. Uh, take it away, announcer man. We'll be right back after these messages. Hello. My name is Mike Bennett, and I'd just like to ask you, when was the last time you had a, a really enjoyable scare? One that made you scream and laugh at the same time? Which, I suppose, would sound something like this. You've never done that? Well, I suggest you track over to MikeBennettPodcast.com and download one of my podcasts. One Among the Sleepless, Hall of Mirrors, Tales of Horror and the Grotesque, Mike Bennett Sometimes, or, coming in 2009, the horror thriller novel Underwood and Flinch. I can't guarantee you'll do this. But then, perhaps that's just as well. MikeBennettPodcast.com <laughs> So you, you went to the podcast and, and you listened to it? <laughs> How was it? It was pretty good. Oh, well, good. That pretty much wraps everything up. I, I guess, let, hey, let's call it a night. We're going to go watch, uh, yeah. we're going to go watch Snow White. Snow White. Our street cred. We just lost it by saying we're going to watch Snow White. Yeah, but it's the Amanda Bynes version. <laughs> so did we get the street cred back? I think it dropped a little lower. Oh, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Don't forget, we all breathe liquid for nine months. Your body will remember. Good Thank night. You. Oh, nice. Is that your part? Go. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. Hey, R O A D T, can you play the slap? Hey, O A D T. What the hell is his name? <laughs> his name is Oedo T. Oedo T, can you play the sad music, please? Now that you're not sad. Naruto! <laughs> My neighbor. Totoro! Totoro! Totoro!